welcome to Can I Just Say? I'm Daphne Olive, and I'm here with television reporter from the New York Post, Lauren Sarner. Hello, everyone. Good to be back discussing the final stretch of Outlander season three. Yep. Final stretch. We made it, Lauren. Barry Hardiman could not be here with us today. She is just way too busy being a very important person over at NPR, and there's just too much news right now. Um, yeah. News, stupid news, keeping Barry away from us. But Barry, we miss you. And uh, we will do our best to uh, be funny. I feel like Barry started to be the funny <laughs> one of the three of us. So she did. Yeah, we'll definitely <laughs> miss her comments. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But yeah, it's just you and me, Tough Cookie. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, okay, we're talking about the last three episodes of season three of Outlander, 311 to 313. Lauren, how do you feel about these three episodes as a unit? Um, I mean, I, I was actually saying this to you before we started the podcast. This, um, The end of season three kind of cemented my theory that Outlander is a little bit weaker at season endings than it is at season beginnings. The, the pacing is always kind of weird and draggy as it gets into the final stretch, and this was no exception. Um, I felt like the climax was a little bit rushed. I also felt like Outlander didn't really itself know what its climax was of season three, and that was a problem. It, the show seemed like it couldn't figure out whether the Gellis showdown was the climax or whether the storm was the climax. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Okay, I'm thinking about that in terms of the book. Yeah. I think the book has both of those also, and yet... They are, and they are both a climax in a way in the book. But the Galus thing is the climax, and the storm is the transition. Does that make sense? Totally. I don't think they manage that at all. Huh. Yeah, it just felt like kind of two just disjointed events that happened to be in the same episode because of how the season was chopped up, and not because of a deliberate storytelling choice. Yes. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think overall my problem has been with the last bit is that. I felt like in the beginning of this season, I know we're going to talk about the season a whole later, but in the beginning of the season, I felt like they were really doing beautiful things thematically. And at the end, we reached the point where it was like, this happens, and then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, but we lost the thread of what the meaning is. It's so true. Yeah, the beginning of the season was very elegant. And I feel like the beginning of a typical Outlander season is usually quite elegant. And then it becomes messy in the, rush, in the run to the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, despite the fact that they cut out so much stuff from the book. I mean, most of it I'm really happy with, some of it I'm less happy about. All right, well, let's let's move on to talking about each episode for themselves. Um, I feel like each one of these episodes has stuff I adore and stuff that just worked less well for me. Of all the gen joints, and all the towns, and all the world. Okay, so I made us a list of things to talk about, but of course we have to start in in 311, Uncharted. We have to start with Claire's wandering through the jungle. <laughs> this is like, you know how in season one, everyone kind of um, talks about that episode, The Search, and they yes. give it shit? Because it deserves shit. This yes. was the search of the se of season three. This episode. <laughs> oh, so you didn't like it? Did you not um, like it? I loved I mean, it. See, I liked it mo be because of extraneous reasons. Because of my love for Black Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Although they made the jungle way more tropical for this than they ever did in Black Sails. Like they added so much tropical foliage there. It's that... true, but I totally recognize the stretch of beach from season four with like know, Flint and Jack. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's our beach. <laughs> yeah, so I so I liked the episode for those reasons, but those actually don't really count in considering Outlander as a unit. <laughs> so no, those um, are completely completely outside of the text of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, within the text of the show, I thought this episode felt like um, it should absolutely the, the events of it should not have been an entire hour, and like they really should have shifted some of the events from future episodes into this one or. I don't know. It, like, it felt like they were stretching it out to waste time. <laughs> That's true. I mean, if you could, it's it is kind of true. Like, I was actually just talking about her actual when she's alone and and dealing with trying to find water and stuff like that. But it's true. I mean, even if you look at that whole episode, like pretty much 
her wandering in the jungle plus her wandering in the weird world of Father Fogden is a bit like of a the whole thing is a bit of wandering in the wandering in the unknown. <laughs> Okay, so let me tell you why I do like it. And then it'll take us to the like, back to the end of the last episode where, you know, I had talked in the la in the two episodes on the ships about how Claire and Jamie had kind of lost their essential selves. And like we saw Jamie get his essential self back when he realized that, you know, he needed to honor his place as a leader and a father. Um, and then Claire still, I felt like, was kind of floundering with who she is in her new environment of having gone back to the 18th century. And for me, when she jumped off the ship to look for Jamie was this moment where she kind of made a break, where she just said, OK, I'm now going to make make a leap of faith, which was a leap of faith that she already did kind of going back in the stones and that we both agreed that that jumping off the ship felt even more so that like, and that, and in a way the thing she had been struggling with was faith, like that she had kept trying to be so scientific in the face of all these superstitions and all these, you know, seeming supernatural related attitudes that other people had, which we found hilarious as a person who had, you know, traveled through time a few times. Um, <laughs> so for me, I just thematically this worked um, because it felt like she made this leap of faith. And then what I liked, well, there are many things I liked about her wandering through the jungle. I loved that we went back to very practical Claire, like super, super competent Claire. Like she's like, I need water. I need this. She was just being very practical about her surroundings and what she needed to do. And I liked that. I like that version of Claire. I've always enjoyed that version of Claire. And I, you know, she, you could say that she had been doing that with the sick uh, sailors that she had, you know, going back to her medical Claire, but that felt to me a little desperate. And this was like that calm version of, of like competency that she has where she just gets down to business. So I like that aspect of it, but I also loved the process of watching her strip away her clothing. I really enjoy that. Like when she was trying to build the fire and then she was like, ah, shit, I really need something that's more flammable. And she starts pulling apart her bum roll. Like you're watching her go through this process. And for me, it felt like a symbol of her stripping away all the things that were encumbering her, that the encumbrances of her essential self that were existing in the trappings of 18th century Claire and we watched her like strip them away, rip them up, use them in different ways, like in very practical ways, like well, some of the fabric became a backpack and, you know, part of her shift, I think, became like the bandages she puts on her legs. Like there was just something about that that really worked for me, that she was like stripping away and stripping away and stripping away to a point where once she got to Father Fogden's, it was almost like it was just Claire. Does that make sense to you? No, I totally or am I reading too oh. much into this? <laughs> that felt very, <laughs> that worked for me. Like that part really worked for me of that segment. No, I agree with that. I think my issue is also, I think I would have more patience for an episode like this in a sequence of that, that lasts for so long. If it would have been earlier in the season. Yes, um, I get it. Like that kind of, yeah. Whereas like we are in the final act of a season, the action should be building and like pausing your entire story to watch a character, you know, kind of slowly strip off their clothing. <laughs> It's just not a way to. No, no, I totally. It's the rising action in a compelling way. No, no, you're totally right. No, and it's interesting because you could almost compare that to the first three episodes where, uh, you know, a lot of viewers were upset that they were spending so much time apart. And that was all about character development. But you're right. That was at the beginning. So it felt like it was building to something. And here it felt like it was pausing something. Yeah. And I was totally into their time apart. And I mm -hmm. actually, now that the season is over, I think it was better when they were apart. <laughs> Because the storytelling felt more deliberate, and I really like the contrast of their different um, settings. Right. The storytelling started feeling more haphazard and less, you know, as you said, and th then this happened, and then this happened. Right. Um, and less deliberate, you know, after they reunited. So, yeah, this episode may, or this segment of her wandering may have made more sense had we spent less time with, like, randomness in Edinburgh. And then, I mean, I don't want to call the Lollybrock episode random. I mean, I thought it was very meaningful. But you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like perhaps had that stuff 
been a little bit more deliberate, not necessarily condensed, but I guess condensed is what we'd need to have this segment be earlier, but have that stuff be a little tighter so that this, if this wandering in the jungle was a little bit early, like as far as I'm concerned, we could have, we could have dis you know, we could have gotten rid of the whole, um, the whole Jonah part which was yeah, not part of the, but right. The but, Jonah stuff could have gone away. We could have just had a little bit of time on the Artemis. And then like, I do think that the stuff on the porpoise was important and then, and then go to this, but leave a little bit more breathing room for the end, um, which a lot of people don't like the end in the book. I think you and I are both like, we like the crazy. Like I, I mean, actually, I like it in the way that I enjoy the shows Riverdale and Taboo. Like I'm delighted by their existence because they're so nuts. <laughs> it's, it's not the same kind of like that I have for a piece of art like Black Sails, right? <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, yeah, it's still it's still liking it. Uh, I see. I do like it. It's funny. So this is, I guess, where I'll say, like, I actually went back. Um, uh, Alistair Stevens, who we had hoped would be on this podcast with us, but he was way too busy with his own podcasting and classes that he teaches online uh, to be with us. I went back because he and I actually covered the last portion of the book together on his uh, podcast that he used to do, The Scott and the Sassanac. You can find that podcast, The Scott and the Sassanac, on StoryWonk. You can also find the current things that Alistair is doing in his company, uh, Point North Media which he does amazing podcasts there. Listen to them all. They're wonderful. And I went back and listened to those because I wanted to remember like what I did love about the end of the book. In some ways, the end of Voyager goes so off the rails and is so nutty that it actually veers into fairy tale, which is something... I mean, there are voodoo zombies. <laughs> there are voodoo zombies. That part I have less, and we will get into... Stuff well, the show cut that show. out, but they added something maybe even worse. <laughs> yeah, well, that's something that's actually in the book, too. But yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. But but the thing about how nutty the end of the book is, is that it takes you to a place where it's like so surreal that you start to be able to look at it more in an archetypal way than in a realistic storytelling way. So if they went all that, if you go all in in that direction, there's a way to understand the character development in kind of surreal terms. And that is a great way. That is one way. I don't, not everyone likes that way, but that is one way to really do interesting work about, about what's happening with the characters and kind of take them to a new place. The show doesn't really do that. Like it keeps some of the weirdness, some of it's delightful. Um, but we'll get to that. The, yeah, the we'll, blood bath yes, we will. To no end. <laughs> yep. Um, but I feel like had they gone all the way with that, they could have played on all of these kind of fairy tale concepts, but they didn't do that. So we just got like a bunch of weird. Yeah. And it, yeah, I mean, again, my nature is always to try to like really, really read stuff into what's going on, which works a little bit here, but not so much. Um, right. But you know, like the fact that they put a snake in, like, did they put a snake in there just to like have something be horrifying and show that Claire's having a rough time? Or did they put a snake in there because it's a snake and we're trying to talk about rebirth and the Garden of Eden? I don't know. I don't think they did it well enough for me to be able to do that interpretation. But if I'm going to see a snake, my mind's going to go there. But they didn't do I it mean, enough to make it actually stick. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me about the, about Outlander in general is um, it's kind of reluctance to embrace some of its own qualities. And by that, I mean, it is a sci-fi story and it is a romance. And yet it kind of it shrinks back from being either of those things um, in terms of how the creators discuss it and in terms of how just it presents itself. Right. And so, yeah, what fascinates me about the end of Voyager and why I was so curious about how the show would handle that is that Outlander is kind of soft sci-fi. Like, yeah, there is time travel, but it's not really lingered on and nothing else is really that magical in it. And then all of the sudden, the end of Voyager becomes super magical. Super um, magical. Yep. Because, <laughs> yeah, Gellis has all these stones and there are talks of prophecies and there are voodoo zombies. So that is a total transition from soft sci-fi into hard sci-fi. But then, but then it kind of also backpedals and doesn't really seem to want to be hard sci-fi. Um, so that that interests me just as someone who is interested in stories and genres and that kind of that sort of thing. And so I was curious about how the show, which doesn't really market itself as a sci-fi show, would handle these 
uh, more overt sci-fi elements. Right. Yeah. See, you're calling them sci-fi. For me, these are very much fantasy elements. That's so interesting. I mean, that's a whole different podcast episode where we could discuss <laughs> where we could discuss if Voyager is a is a fantasy story or a sci-fi story. <laughs> well, okay, so fantasy and sci-fi are often grouped together right. when they we're talking are. about genres. So yeah, yeah. What, what, however you want to term it, e- even if we're referring to it as fantasy, Outlander doesn't seem to want to think of itself as a fantasy, even though it is one. Right. And, but yet, then it suddenly veers very abruptly into that at the end of Voyager. Right. Okay. Well, then we can talk about Father Fogden. And I can say, it's funny, because we're talking about the three episodes, a lot of the stuff I wanted to say about 311 has been rendered moot because they didn't follow through with the thing that I thought they were doing about identity and home and where people fit. They didn't really go there. Like they kind of, they still, they still hint at it, but I feel like this promise that we had in the beginning that they like, it just got diluted by the end. Like I do think that they might have been trying to do that, that theme, which is, it's in my eyes, truly the central theme of Voyager, it being a voyage, them going on on a voyage from a place to another place. Like that, that is a story about identity that's always going to be to some extent a story about identity when you move people through time and through space and out of their homes to a to a foreign place to a place where they are outlanders to some extent that's always going to be a story about identity but they didn't really do that (laughs) so (laughs) I was going to talk about how it was interesting that Claire after spending two episodes on ships like denying all of the things that other people believed in that she was so adamantly arguing with because I guess she was holding on to some idea of the world being real and measurable and scientific. I did think it was interesting that she em- embraced Coco. I mean, she embraced Coco as um, not because she believed Coco was actually speaking to Father Fogden, but she used it to manipulate him. But still, I felt like that did have a little bit of meaning after she kind of refused to embrace all of the other stuff. Like she refused the Jonah, she refused the the um, the horseshoe, like all of those things, and that this was a situation. But now I think, eh, that was just her like making something happen. I don't think that actually... <laughs> <laughs> has any thematic meaning yeah it's another thing that is occasionally maddening about outlander so you can never tell if like something is actually profound or if something is just the writers throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks yep pretty much so yes i think that was i mean that yeah that was just like she needed father fogden to to agree although then she just ran off anyway so i don't know so i don't i'm not sure why she's needed to talk to coco <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure there was any reason why she needed to talk to Coco. Yeah. And the only thing that I guess was supposed to be the conversation ultimately with Father Fogden was about, you know, a love that 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 you never forget, like a, a love that influences your life forever. I mean, that's it. I think that's kind of what we get out of the Father Fogden part, which, again, it's a little it feel it felt to me like a little bit ultimately like a bit of a waste of time. I'm yeah, not exactly. sure what we I'm not sure what we got out of the Father Fogden section of this other than Claire needed to hear about Yi Tin Cho eating the goat so that she would know where to find them. And I don't know, I mean, maybe just cultural tourism. I mean, I think that's where we end up once she hits land is like we end up with a lot of like cultural tourism that a lot of it's quite offensive. And we will <laughs> so, yeah, to say the least. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll have stronger things to say very soon. About but that. I, I honestly think and I mean, this is kind of a moot point because season four is already being made. But I really think Outlander's hurting itself with 13 episodes. I think these seasons should be 10 episodes. Like it seems like yeah. every season has an episode like this one where it's just kind of filled with meaningless scenes and filler. And it really should have been condensed into 10 episodes. It could have been or... Again, I have a long list of things like as much as they cut and a lot of it that I'm really happy with the cuts that they made and the adaptation choices they made. Like there's stuff they cut that I think would have made a lot of what we do have a lot more palatable. Um, I don't know if you remember Ishmael. Like Ishmael is a big part of it for me. Ishmael was a very meaningful character. And again, we'll get into that later. But Ishmael was... um, was uh, uh, Galus talks about the person who made her her truth serum tea now there isn't truth serum tea in the book but but uh Ishmael was <clears throat> excuse me was a healer 
of the African traditions who who he was the one who made her the voodoo, whatever medicine. And he's an interesting character because he is very much tied thematically to Jamie and he um yeah, it's hard to get into all the different things. But let's just say there was a character that had he been included, I feel like it would have done a lot more a lot more respectful treatment to um the Marin community, which we only see as a spectacle, not as a community. Okay. Is there anything? I, God, wow. That's it? That's all I have to say uh, about 311? Well, yeah. Oh, no. There's more to talk about 311? We have the was... end of 311. That's the good part. <laughs> well, I'll also say, I feel like I've been very negative about 311. I'll say one positive thing. I really liked the playful boat sex scene. Right. Um, and I think in general, uh, we were actually disagreeing about this a little bit. In general, I think this season has done a great job with the sex scenes. You were disagreeing a little bit, right? I was disagreeing a little bit. Wait, but before we get to there, we have to talk about the wedding. Okay. We have to talk about the wedding. Yes. I love the wedding. I mean, okay, Father Fogden is like silly. He's silly in the book and he's silly here and they didn't cut that out, whatever. But what I there's two things I love about the wedding. I love Marsley. I love Marsley talking to Claire. I love Marsley and her like, let's get on with it, Mr. Mr. Priest man. Like, I need to marry my my husband so that, you know, we can get on to the honeymoon <laughs> she kills me I love her so much but also really for me more so than the playful sex they're about to get to is the moment where Fergus needs a name and that Jamie says that his name is Fraser and yes I adore that I mean that is in the book and it does you know counter my sometimes argument that that somehow you know they're just not enough quite enough recognizing that Fergus is their son, although the show does a much better job of that than the book. But that was really wonderful scene and beautifully played and just so moving to me. I just I really love that. I love that Fergus gets the recognition he always deserved. And I love Fergus's experience of that as well. Yes. And like, I've totally gone on the record as in the past saying that Outlander has a side character problem. And I still maintain that. However, I will say that they've done a really good job of making the case for Fergus and Marsali, and I'm totally invested in them, and I care about them, actually more than I care about Roger and Brianna as a couple. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know if it's the acting or just the storytelling, but whatever they've done, um, well, I, I think both. But um, yeah, they've really done a solid job of making you, giving you another couple to care about, not necessarily as much as Jamie and Claire, but to at least be interested in when they're on the screen. <laughs> right. No, you really, I, I really care about them. And, and that's not just because of later books. Like it is also because of the actual portrayal here. Both of the Fergus actors, and I don't have their names written down, but both of them are fantastic. They and are. Feel, and I think you said this, like feel like the same person. It's fascinating. It's amazing when they can do that. So yeah, so that scene is very, very important to me. And I loved it very, very much. Okay, now we can get onto the turtle soup, which is actually a sex scene I like. Um, I do like that one. So yes, let's get into that discussion. I was complaining to Lauren that I feel like most of the sex scenes in this season, unlike in season one, we don't need to get into season two, but unlike in season one, I feel like a lot of the sex scenes have been, do I want to call it fan service? Like that they've, they've just not been interesting to me that much. Like, yeah, I mean, Katrina Balfe and Sam Hewen are lovely to look at, no question. But I feel like if you look at the sex scenes in season one, you know, and the wedding episode being the pinnacle of that, the sex scenes are always about character development. They always feel like we're that the characters are like that they mark a new place for the characters and that they even that they take us at the end of the scene to a new place with the characters that this is about their relationship and about them as individuals learning and and becoming. Whereas the sex scenes here are cute. This one's definitely cute and hot, you know, no question and drunk Claire is one of my favorite things. And this drunk Claire is the best <laughs> drunk Claire we've ever had. Um, but I just feel like they are there because we want to have sex scenes, not because it's about the characters. You know, I, I do not disagree with that, actually. I, I think you're right. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, I, I'm I'm just kind of glad that, like, 
sex happens to be one of the things that Outlander is best at. And in, at first, it seems like it didn't know its strengths and weaknesses because in season two, it was trying to get into politics when <laughs> that's just not his strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, no, I totally agree with you that these sex scenes are not necessarily heavy on character development with the exception of the print shop, obviously. Um, but um, Although in yeah. the print shop, they don't have sex. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, they, I'm generally more engaged with them when they're being romantic and not having sex than when they're actually having sex. But just the way the sex scene is filmed, at least, um, or at least I was telling you, I a lot of my friends who watch the show are not book readers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are really impressed with... Uh, like the sex on the show because it is very different from the way you see TV sex a lot. It feels like it uh, was written by people who understand how female pleasure works, yes. which is not usually how sex is filmed on TV. So yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I'm happy that it's there for that reason. And also when the plot is kind of a drag, it's a nice little way to break it up. I mean, I guess that in itself is a little bit of a problem that I feel that way. <laughs> that the- <laughs> well, I also like it intellectually. Let's say that. But I get sometimes I this season I get bored during the actual scenes. Not the turtle soup one. The turtle soup one was not. That was fun and and definitely sexy and fun. Mostly fun. But yeah, I find myself like starting to look at my watch during the sex scenes. I mean, it's interesting because I know, I know a lot of fans were complaining that there wasn't enough sex in season two, um, and it's totally true, but at the same time, it's like, are you going to make this a softcore porn show? Because the thing is, the books do have a lot of sex. But, a lot of sex. But o- often it's just a few lines, though, whereas a sex scene on TV is so different because it has to be, you know, several minutes and right. the whole thing. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it, it, it plays out so differently, you know, watching a whole scene than reading a few lines on a page. Right. No, it's true. And Diana Gabaldon, she writes sex really well. There is no question that woman can write a sex scene. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> she can. I like them. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, you know, again, and I don't want to sound like I'm against them. I just... And, and I know there are people who are really enjoying them. So I don't want to rain in your parade. If you're enjoying them, enjoy them. I'm so happy for you. Like, I wish I was enjoying them more. Like, I just, the one, not in the print shop, but the one later in the, in um, Madame Jeanne's, I found boring. And the one at the end, I find a little boring. The turtle soup one is actually, and the one that they had in on the Artemis, I liked. But that was very, like, fast and fast and heavy. But yeah, I just, uh, I wish I liked it more. I really do. I really <laughs> wish. And again, it's like the wedding episode is one of my favorite ever episodes of television with sex in it. Like hands yeah, I, down. I agree with that. It was so beautifully done. Amazing. And, but again, it was all about character. So for me, that's much more sexy. Like connection between people and interplay of emotions that's sexy for me just watching people have sex as much as they are seeming to enjoy it like that for me isn't enough no i agree i just i just i go back to being glad that this exists more totally no no absolutely <laughs> glad that we, it's represented on tv right. um completely and glad in when agreement. i'm watching an episode that i feel is tedious like okay great another sex scene that is actually good <laughs> right very woman forward sex scenes totally, yeah i am i am 100 percent behind that concept and it's true outlander has done an amazing job with that in a world that we don't have that so much well and quite frankly when i'm really frustrated with a show for other stuff like some race stuff that we'll have to get into yeah. um at least it, it still does have you know some feminism so i can't like i'm anytime i'm ready to a ban- to just totally stop watching outlander it always does something small to hook me back um and i guess the sex scenes were kind of that thing in the second and, and gallus yeah see for me it's of- all characters for me i mean i i did warn on twitter like this is the episode where i'm just gonna be like let's talk about gallus and lord john so for me it's character like we're just in a different place about this like i love all the small characters uh, Father Fogden less so, although he was kind of charming. I mean, I've got to say, like, he was quirky and charming, and I I enjoyed that, even though the part of the episode did, wasn't didn't feel that meaningful. And and again, for me, the foreplay in even in the Turtle Soup was much better for me. Like, I loved the whole thing about her needing to inject herself with penicillin, and 
the whole discussion <laughs> of her being, you know, being hot and like a demon, like that stuff I loved. I don't know. I enjoy I maybe I enjoy the foreplay more than I enjoy the sex in this season. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. All right. Well, I guess uh, we can move on to 312 then. Yes. All right. The Bakra. Well, we know how the Bakra starts, so let's talk about Galus. Yay. I adore everything about Galus. I've always loved her. Um, I adore how she kind of oscillates between uh, this kind of ridiculous high camp witchiness. Like, it's almost like she's acting in a different show than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And usually that's an insult to say about a show that the actors are on different levels. But for some reason, it really works with with Gallus and what she's been doing. Well, that actually kind of fits Gallus's her character, her role as a character in the story. She is kind of in a different story than everyone else. Like she's like she and Claire share the fact that they're time travelers. But Galus is the only person at this point who like. She's the only one there that sees herself as having this deliberate role in changing history. Like even when Claire and Jamie were trying to change history, Claire never saw this as some sort of God given role that she has. And. Galus, like everyone else is just living life, right? So everyone else is just living life. Claire, or operating by the seat of their pants. Right, whatever. But, you know, everyone's just like living in the reality that is given to them. You know, like you and I, like we're just, we're here. This is our time frame. We're just living our <laughs> lives, right? So that's what everyone's saying. I didn't just get out of a bloodbath. You know what? You might have. You also might be a time traveler for all I know, Lauren. I know you pretty well, but, you know, I would not be surprised. Um, but, but, you know, so it's like everyone's just living their lives. Claire and Galus are the two people who are time travelers so far, as revealed by the show. <laughs> as far as we know right now, Claire and, Claire and Galus are the only two time travelers. And they're very different. And this was one of the things um, that I thought was fascinating that Alistair brought up um, in the Scott and the Sassanic. When we were talking about the book, Alistair brought up this fascinating difference between them that Claire stumbled into time travel, right? So he that's what he said, that, she, that Claire's essentially living in a fairy tale, right? Like this is like fairy stories, like when people like stumble off into the woods and end up spending, you know, 50 years with the fairies when they think that they're, think that they're asleep or think that they're, you know, doing something else. So Claire's kind of living in a fairy story and Galus is actually the one who's living in, depending on how you want to define it, the sci-fi or the or the fantasy story, because she's the one who orchestrated her time travel. And this is this fascinating difference between them. And so in a way, Galus isn't a different story. Like she made herself travel in time with a goal, a goal that she obviously believes is something that was appointed to her because she's special. Like she brings that up in the last episode. And so she is living in a completely different story than everyone else. And just the entrance of the bloodbath, uh, that's one of the things where I think the, sh the show is a lot better than the books. Like, it's such an amazing, dramatic visual. It it's is so, so over the top. It's so perfect so, for her. <laughs> it is perfect for her. And she, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just... And also, um, I, I love the historical connotations. I don't know. Do you know who Elizabeth Bathory is? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. No, but now tell me, please. So she was a Hungarian countess uh, in the, oh, I want to say 1500s, but don't quote me on that. That might be wrong. But she was a Hungarian countess who famously killed a bunch of peasants and bathed in their blood. Um, she's one of the kind of most famous lady murderers in history. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know if the writers, I'm sure they were aware of that. And so she bathed in blood to try to stay young. Um, so it was just kind of echoing that when Galus did that. Oh, I love that too, because that also would be a bit of a kind of time travel thing. Like you could almost, you could almost like headcanon in that that was actually Galus, like in a different period that she... Oh, you totally could. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> but, or, or regardless, that would be something that Galus, as someone who reads, would have known about. Mm -hmm. And of course, deranged Galus would be like, I want to imitate this person. Right. Absolutely. She seems like she a would. great role model. Well, and it also, it just fits, you know, even book Gillis, like it fits her character that has this like bizarre combination of being, you know, kind of batshit crazy and also 
like really vain. So I just love that it ties those two things together, like her sense of drama, like her sense of like kind of the drama, the drama of herself, the drama of her presence and who she thinks she is, combined with the vanity of wanting to stay young looking. Yeah, I mean, she was already delightful enough in season one when she was just giving crazy eyes and then talking about a fucking barbecue. Yes. Uh, But they really just turned up the knob here. I loved it so much. So this is where we should say that you actually interviewed her for the New York Post. I'm sorry, I did. not Galis, but Lotte Verbeek. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And yeah, she was talking about how they took an entire day to film that sequence. And it was quite complicated because she was trying to look dramatic, but also trying not to slip because obviously it was very slippery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said that poor, um, oh no, I'm forgetting the actor's name, but the guy who plays young Ian, mm-hmm. she said she grew really close with him, but the poor guy kept on eating so much cake because he was supposed to be oh. eating cake during that scene. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't sure how he wasn't throwing up oh that's very <laughs> sweet oh my goodness <laughs> yes I love this scene so much I really really do I think that there's an interesting twist that they did with Galus and Claire that comes up in 313 but I, I think it's interesting already what she's saying to young Ian when you look back from 313 uh, which is that when she asks when she finds out about Jamie um and love love the whole truth tea that's great and then when she says well what does he want with my treasure all ian says is to pay a debt which is fascinating when you look in 313 at how galus has now kind of told the story of herself and claire in her mind as claire actually actively being the antagonist to galus like galus has now decided that claire as an as a fellow time traveler has been just as Galus has been deliberately trying to change history to bring back a Scottish King. She decided that Claire has actively been working against her. So when all that young Ian says is to pay a debt, it would be just, it would be so easy for her to think later on that that debt was actually to Claire, even though she sees that Lauren John has the Sapphire but when she finds out that Claire's there, I could so see her mind going, oh, OK, so Jamie needed to pay a debt to Claire because she doesn't she makes it so obvious. And we knew this in season one, but she makes it so obvious that she doesn't really get romance. That's why um, Galus is, in my opinion, the best Outlander villain, because like her, she has such a clear motive. And mm-hmm. so she's very she, um Whereas other villains, like um, even Black Jack Randall, he was just kind of evil just because he was. I mean, because he obviously had some kind of psychological sure. disorder. Sure, sure. But he didn't really have like a grand plan or like you couldn't really see the story from his perspective. And if right. you if you read Outlander for his, for, for, from his perspective, that wouldn't be an interesting story. Nope. Whereas Galus, there's a whole book, the story from her perspective. And I would read that book Absolutely. and it would make sense. And it would be a great book. Right. She has a purpose. And it's a purpose that not always, but now especially, goes completely in conflict with what Claire, with Claire's purpose. Like that wasn't exactly the case in season one, uh, which also makes it more complex because it's so clear, even at the end, like Galus cares about Claire. Like she will, you know, she will thwart her and possibly kill her and definitely kill her daughter. But but she's still like they kept a few lines from the book, like about saying that, you know, she doesn't want to hurt Jamie for Claire's sake. Like she that makes it even better. Like the fact that they that they're antagonists to each other who I don't know. Do you think Claire still cares? I don't think Claire still cares about Galus, but I think Galus does care about Claire. Well, think about it. She, she's not had many friends. No, right. I, I feel like she's been very lonely because unlike Claire, she doesn't have anyone to confide in about her time travel uh, issues. So she's just operated alone. Yeah, she lives in isolation and Claire lives in community. I'm going to bring that up soon, too, as far as like time travel stuff. But yeah, that's that is the main difference between them is that Claire makes connections with people that Claire it's it is almost like Galus went back in time but she's still living her late 60s self even though she integrated herself you know from a performance level in the 18th century she's she's hasn't changed course like she's doing the thing that she decided in 67 to do 
she's dedicated her life to it and that's all that there right. is so it's almost like she's in the 18th century but she never became part of it and that's the big difference is that claire you know she's still an outlander she's still odd she's still different she still has sensibilities from from you know her existence in the future but she became part of this world she has a family she you know she has people that she cares about and Galus, it's it's like she's just still that same person from the 60s, just transposed and trying to fulfill the same goal. So she is completely in isolation. And I, I love how Outlander isn't afraid to take itself too seriously when it comes to her. And it has a kind of paradoxical result of her feeling like the most complex and serious villain. Right. Absolutely. Whereas when it takes itself extremely seriously with other villains... Um, like, I mean, okay, the, the Garrison Commander is one of the best episodes. It's absolutely fabulous. Absolutely. So I'm, like, I'm not trying to criticize um, its, t- its complete and overall depiction of Blackjack. But, in ge- but just uh, in general, kind of after that episode with its depiction of him, it just wasn't as nuanced, even though it was trying to be more serious. It wasn't giving him bloodbaths or anything very melodramatic. Well, and again, and he, just like you said, like he doesn't have a purpose. Galus has a purpose. We know what her purpose is. We know what she's trying to do. We know why she's trying to do it. You know, we may be horrified with her means, but it's completely clear and believable what it is she's trying to do. Well, although that's why I was a little disappointed. I don't want to jump the gun and talk about in her death because they gave Black Jack such an epic, you know, mythical finish with Jamie. And I feel that because Galus and Claire have almost revolved around each other in the same way. Yep. Galus deserved a much more mythical death than just a really quick swipe of a sword. And Mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. That was extremely anticlimactic and much more than it should have been. Hmm. That is very interesting. I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean, the like only- even some weird slow mo filmmaking, <laughs> <you know? laughs> which I generally don't like. But- <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Bayless deserves it, right? A little bit more time on the actual like thing between her and Claire. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, honestly, also when I the thing that kept me re- I, reading uh, the books, the few the few that I read, uh, book one through four and a half, um, was. Uh, <laughs> I was actually very curious about Galus as the fellow time traveler. And so I was reading book two. I was waiting for Galus to come back mm-hmm. and then she wasn't coming back. But then she was mentioned, but then wouldn't appear for hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of pages. Yeah. And then finally she came back in book three and then I kind of felt cheated because then she dies right away. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yes. Yeah, you, like, really, made it you do so need, you totally need the, the Galus book, don't you? I do need the Galus <laughs> book. This does not surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Should we move on? We shall. To your guy? No, we have to talk. I get, well, okay, you know what? Let's talk about Temerary in 313. Let's let's put off a little bit our displeasure about the... No, we got to do it. Okay, let's talk about... Let's talk about the market and, and, ha- and Claire buying Temerary or whatever. Jamie buying Temerary in Claire's name. Uh... I am troubled by this. I understand what they were trying to do, but Outlander has not earned it because it it was just using minority characters as a prop to Jamie and Claire's story in a really gross way. Right. So, yeah, I do want to not too much. I mean, we have a few Black Sails mentions, but I'm going to I actually want to quote one of the showrunners of Black Sails who also told a story in the Caribbean in the 18th century. And he John Steinberg said that there is no way to ta- tell a story in the 18th century in the Caribbean without giving due respect to the fact that slavery was a huge part of the world there. And I understand that Outlander isn't about what's going on in Jamaica at the time. And at the same time, for me, uh, this this whole thing was very troubling because I feel like all of the depictions of enslaved people and formerly enslaved people in 313 exist solely as window dressing and also things to show us stuff about Claire and Jamie. Yes, I completely agree. And with some, with a topic as sensitive as slavery, that's totally egregious to use it as window dressing. Exactly. Like if you're going to have that in your show, in your story, you need to, you cannot have those window dressing. Exactly. So like it would be it's troubling if you take your story to Jamaica in the 
in the 18th century and you don't show it at all. But for me, it's actually more troubling when you do that, when you talk about the buying and selling and abuse and freeing of a man without really, I mean, they did have Temerary say, okay, this is where I want to get out. And this is because I want to go to this community at the end. Like, so he did, he did make the choice of when and where he wanted his life to continue after this. So there's that one moment that makes it a, a smidgen better, but basically I don't like it. Like I even like in the book better that the fact that Jamie tries to speak Patois, like the fact that, that, that Temerary only speaks English, that the enslaved people all speak English, and that there's not even a struggle on that front, like that Jamie and Claire have entered a world in which there's a different language that they would have to try to speak to communicate. I mean, it just, <sighs> the enslaved people in these two episodes for me really are almost like props. And that's really bothers me. Well, this was uh, to make to make a little analogy. This was the same thing. A bunch of Game of Thrones viewers were very upset. Um, in the fifth season, there was a rape scene, and during the scene, they um, panned uh, another boy man, yeah. Theon. For anyone who's familiar with Game of Thrones, <laughs> um, and Sansa was being raped, and they panned to show Theon's face, and all the viewers were very mad because they made Sansa's rape about Theon and his development. And like, rape is such a sensitive topic that it just felt totally egregious to you to rape a female in order to develop a male. This feels like the same thing. Uh, show some slavery mm -hmm. in order to show us how progressive Claire is. And <laughs> right. Well, and again, there, there was a character in the book that really, um, that he and Jamie actually related as people. And it made an interesting connection about how England has uh, treated enslaved people and treated Scotland after the rising. And that is that in a way that was like not just about Jamie, like that was actually making a true connection between the two of them and and talked about oppression overall. Um, but that's not happening here. Like really, Temerary is really just a plot point. I mean, he really is. Like they could have had someone else report to them about Ian. Like he just exists so that they can talk about whether or not they should free him or gets talk about the fact that they should free him. They don't disagree about that. But, but the... But it's it's really offensive to me, like that the two of them are discussing like when and how and and, you know, what would be the appropriate way to do that? I, I really think they should have just like cut that out. Yeah, they right. should not have even included it. Exactly. Like it was just not right. They did it poorly is what I'm trying to say, perhaps with the best of intentions, but not with. Uh, yeah. OK. All right. We did enough of that. Let's talk about. <laughs> Lord John, because we're going to have to talk about stuff in 313 too. And I'm just, yeah, I'm kind of mad at them. Um, Outlander is not great with race. I know, I know, I know. And yet I still get to be mad at them because I am. Let's talk about, well, right. And then we get to, then we get to the governor's mansion and Jamie talks about how Willoughby is there to be a distraction. Cheers. We did Minorities really, as props. Right. We did a really good job with the Eaton show. And now it's like, oh, dude, you're just here to be exotic so that nobody notices us. They said that. That's essentially what they said. Yes. Let's get on to Lord John Gray because I want something to make me happy and he makes me so happy. <laughs> uh, I don't even know where to start. It was amazing. I loved when they introduced to each other and he, just David Barry is the best. He's incredible. Uh, he's one of those people that can do the slightest. I think I said this in the last episode. I'm going to say it again. He can do the slightest things with his face that just show you such a range of emotions happening at the same time. It's incredible. And I'm going to assume that Jamie has not, uh, Jamie has obviously told Claire about his friendship with John, but I'm going to assume he hasn't told her, by the way, he's also in love with me. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a fair assumption there. I think he left that bit out. <laughs> they did such a good job just acting with their faces. You could totally see, <sighs> Her realizing that John yep. is in love with Jamie and just, you know, that that scene didn't need any words between them. It no. was just that was Outlander at its most elegant, just very, you know, great character development in a very understated way. Yes. No, it's incredible. And every interaction is incredible. Like when they first meet is incredible. When he takes them into the private space, his office, maybe. Like, that was also amazing. Yeah. And that's where I loved watching Claire going, huh. 
And um, and and also Lord John going like he was very surprised that she knew about Willie. Like it was just fascinating. Um, I really appreciate this was the moment um, where I really appreciate that Jamie had told Claire about Willie um, in episode six, because in the book, that is a surprise to Claire. And it's a surprise that Lord John tells her. And it and the the I like that they kept a little bit of the kind of a little bit of the sharpness when Claire and Lord John are talking to each other. It's quite vicious in the book. And I don't like I didn't like that at all. It felt like that the secret of Willie was kept so that Claire and Lord John could be vicious towards each other, which is less impactful for me than this version where they seem to respect each other and be envious of each other at the same time. Yeah, Which is not like to it. make it a love triangle. Just want to make clear. Not a love <laughs> triangle. Not a love triangle. Claire's <laughs> just a little bit on you know, she's just a little bit set back from the fact that that she didn't know to what extent Jamie and John were intimate emotionally with each other. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm stumbling over myself here. Really not a love triangle. <laughs> but yeah, in the book, it does, at least to me, feel like a love triangle, or, le- or at least it's the story is trying to make it one. And so yeah, in the show, it doesn't feel that way. It just feels no. like a, a tense and complicated situation, which exactly. it is. Right. And super bittersweet for Lord John, and even a little bit for Claire in a way that's very appropriate. Like it's a, yeah. it's a reminder to her of those 20 years, the fact that Jamie it turns out was so close with someone that she never even knew as part of his life. And it's such a, it's such an elegant scene that it makes me forgive Outlander for the completely unelegant, very clunky storytelling of what a coincidence. Claire and Jamie are in the same place as Gellis and Lord John Gray and (laughs) Mary and uh, her brother. I don't even care, Arthur. I don't even care. That's three (laughs) whole characters who bump into each other by coincidence in one hour like yep. Outlander is really straining the whole we don't really know how to tell the story so we're just gonna throw these characters here and have them bump into each other kind of thing. Like, so that's totally how it happens in the book which is hilarious um but yes um <laughs> hilariously they were really really careful not to include all of the coincidences that happen in the book because there's so many more they, I mean that was another they, reason I they were a bit restrained <laughs> That was another reason I stopped reading because I was like, all right, this is just rape scenes and ridiculous coincidences. So I'm out. (laughs) Well, and it's funny because, again, this is veering into the fairy tale. I like like Jamie does have a line that I really enjoy where um, where he says, perhaps because of your coming through the stones, ghosts are drawn to us as we are to each other. Like, I love that he brought this to a slightly mystical place. And I like that, especially, again, when we we really, you know, there is this undercurrent throughout of how people, different people look at the time travel. So perhaps Jamie does see it in a slightly mystical way. And um, Claire, you know, still kind of adamantly chooses not to. And Galus takes it to a whole nother place where she sees this as a calling. So for me, for me, that kind of works. That's a nice use of the fact that there's these crazy coincidences to actually give Jamie that line that is not in the book. Then it's a neat line because it's just like, he, I always feel like Jamie's way more open to this. You know, it, like he's not, you know, it's like, remember with the baby on the fairy hill in, in the first season, like there was the whole thing where Claire's like, yeah, fuck that. Like, I'm going to save this baby. And Jamie's like, hey, I don't actually believe this but I understand the people who do. So it's like, if you had this continuum of belief in magic, like Jamie's somewhere in the middle, like he's an agnostic. He's not going to like swear against it, but he's not going to like full on believe the stuff. Claire hilariously, despite her own experiences, is like, I don't believe anything. (laughs) And Galus is like, I believe everything. (laughs) Yeah, that does. It does work nicely. It's a nice little divide. (laughs) Okay, so now we have the whole thing with the sapphire, and I meant to do more research than I did on the bronze seer. Um, I did Wikipedia again, and I did listen to the episodes with Alistair. Like, so can I can I get a little geeky for a second and talk about how it is in the show and versus the book? Let's geek out on gemstones. Okay, first of all, the gemstones part of time travel in the book, not part of of the prophecy. Like that's not that's not part of the prophecy because. Um, 
in the book, uh, Arthur is actually connected to Galus because she brought him to tell her about the about the prophecy of the bronze seer, which I looked up and he is actually possibly a historical person. He is actually a Mackenzie and now I'm forgetting which I think he's from the 17th century. And he did, you know, he's kind of like a Nostradamus sort of figure that he made all these prophecies that people are like, "Ooh, that actually came true. And that actually came true. And I couldn't figure out if the prophecy in the book is actually one of his things. But his the prophecy in the book is about the line of Lord Lovett, of 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 the fox, of Jamie's grandfather, that somebody from that line, one of those phrasers of Lovett, would actually somehow bring about Scottish independence again. Or a new Ooh. king, a Scottish king, right? So it's much more vague in the book. And Galus also does discover about Brianna and then want to go forward in time to find Brianna, not to kill her. I love what they did in the show, that they made this wonderful riddle about the 200-year-old baby that made it much cleaner. I mean, also made Galus want to kill Brianna, not just find her. But like in the book, and I'm I'm curious, like I don't know how lo- how far they're going to go with the books, like how many seasons they're going to end up doing. The fact that they change this does have a bit of a butterfly effect. Like this stuff comes up in Moby. This comes up in the, that is the eighth book. This stuff does come up again. <laughs> so I don't know what they're going to do with that. I don't know if they care at this point, but um, changing, <laughs> changing, that will force them to change aspects of that book, I assume. Um, but yeah, so that's the big difference. I like what they did. I think it was, I think it's much more elegant the way they did it for the storytelling. Like it makes Claire's motivation to kill Galus much clearer if Galus wants to kill her daughter rather than just find her daughter with with a purpose that's not quite clear. Yeah, because also it was nice because then if it had been to just find her daughter, I feel like we would have gotten a voiceover from Claire saying, I had to kill her otherwise. <laughs> right, blah, blah, blah. which is what you get. Well, in the book, it's not voiceover because it's all from... Claire's POV but yeah she has a whole thing about like mothers find in human strength when they're when their children are are in danger and she has this whole story about a car accident and it's it's pretty cool but yes it would have ended up being voiceover because that's the only way you could do it and so I'm glad that the show found a tidy way to get voiceover out of that scene they did well they found a tidy way to to link all these parts together in a way that didn't take as much explanation it just took this one prophecy of Margaret's with deciphering from Arthur for them to get and then Galus finding the port, well, seeing the portrait. So yeah, I think they did a good job with that. Should we briefly say that the mansion is the brothel in Black Sails? The, right, I'm right, right about that? I am correct. I think that the mansion is for sure, not the, you mean Galus's? Yeah. Yeah, Galus's house is to- has to be the interior of the brothel in Black Sails. It looks like it. It looks like it to me too. Right. It's the real, I mean, it's the floor. It looks like the NASA town set. Yes. Well, that's what I was going to say is that the market, the thing I like about the market scene is that it is 100% the market in black sales, like that you see people walking through. It's where Jack leaves Anne behind, where people eat sometimes. Like there's a lot of walking down that market. And the, are those cages the cages that Flint and his men are in season three? Maybe that, I don't know if I'll go that far. Yeah, okay. Yeah, those are pretty easy to build. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> sure. There's also cages, you know, there's cages in Charlestown. There's cages, you know, there's lots of, I don't I don't know about that. But I'm almost positive that the market is the market and that Galus's house is the brothel. And I miss the brothel. <laughs> Things I never expected myself to say. <laughs> um. Okay, I think I, I'm i ready to go to 13. Is there more that you wanted to say about the Bakra? Uh, no, I think we covered it. I was taken out of the story for a minute when uh, Gayla said the case of Benjamin Button. Yeah, I know. Because then you're like thinking, when was that book written? Like, would she have been aware of it? Yes. Yeah. Of all the gin joints? That totally worked for me. Yeah, that works. But uh, yeah, the Benjamin Button thing was a little bit. All yep, right. <laughs> for me too. Right. And why would she say that? Like, she is always so careful to not use anachronistic language like the own like that's why the fucking barbecue was so cool because it was the first time we ever saw Gala say something anachronistic in the show yeah. so for her to say something like that to Arthur I mean maybe it's supposed to show that she's equally vexed but uh yeah I agree didn't really work okay so 
313, the eye of the storm. One of my favorite things is, uh, is wait, who said by what authority? Now I'm trying to remember. Uh, oh, right. Lord that, Dungray laying down the law. Right. Well, it's, I like it is that when the Redcoats come and meet, uh, shoot, I'm forgetting his name. I should know his name. Um, mm, and Lord John even made a big deal out of it. Lieutenant, I mean, Captain Leonard. So when the Redcoats meet Leonard and this and they stop him and he says, by what authority are you stopping us? And then we go straight to Lord John Gray's face. And I was like, yes, I like this. <laughs> I'm so happy. That was the best opening to an episode ever, as far as I'm concerned. I loved it so much. Um, yes, Lord I like John Gray was really the highlight of this episode. <laughs> It's kind of the highlight of these two episodes of 12 and 13, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> For me, it's Galus. No, but and Lord Galus, right. Say. Well, yes, it's, yeah, it's really, the end of this show is really the Galus and Lord John show, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Uh, I think we're both making that clear. But yes, I love, this to me felt like really pulling from um, Lord John Gray's books, because this level of forcefulness is something that I know Lord John Gray has but is not really in Voyager. And I love it. I loved it. He is a badass here. But a, a very like proper wig wearing badass. A proper wig, wig wearing badass who's like a sensitive soul as we, we've already established that he's a sensitive soul. So we love, well, and even if you compare this, like you can really see time has passed here. Like if you, even if you compare this to when he was, when he was the governor of Ardsmuir and he was still so kind of unsure of his own authority and then you see this version and it's like, dude knows who he is. He really is, has no question about what his authority is and how he can talk to people and what he can get away with. Honestly, he's had the best character development this season. Right? <laughs> no joke. He wins the character development he game. He wins the character development. He wins everything as far as I'm concerned. I love him so much. I know this is what I want. You want the Galus book. I want the Lord John Gray books turned into a tv show that's what i want i mean maybe stars would do a spinoff outlander is kind of their biggest show I, you know if they did uh, they're and they're perfect i mean the books there's there's shorter books they're all kind of mysteries um they have you know kind of like fancy london life and then also offbeat stuff and yeah they've got kind of upstairs downstairs stuff going on and mysteries and this now this amazing actor that they have playing this character I'm on board. I want them to do that. You could be the script consultant so that to edit it whenever they start, you know, getting messy. I offer my services. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, now let's talk about uh, Galus and Claire. And I, I loved their conversation so much. I really, I did really loved it. And this, I guess I already talked about some of the things I love it. I love that Galus sees Claire as this antagonist, as this person who's been trying to thwart her. I really like that so much. Again, to this I, this thing about their different relationships to magic is that Galus talks about going through the stones, the needing sacrifice, and Claire says it's an accident. And this, I feel like, really epitomizes who each of them is. Not just who they are as time travelers, but who they are as people. It's interesting also that the show doesn't quite make it clear because... It could be both. Claire was talking about how it has to do with who's on the other side of the stones waiting for you. Right. And in her in her cases, the show has made that argument. But Galus has also traveled and she has done it while killing husbands. So the show has also presented an argument for that. Well, but that's what's interesting to me about it is that it's like they both have such a different methodology. But that goes to their different ways of looking at this that for Claire, it's about relationships, and for Galus, it's about sacrifice for a cause. Usually, with uh, with devices like this, there is you know one clear way. So it really interests me that <laughs> <laughs> we aren't. <laughs> it isn't. Well, uh, let me muddle it a little bit more. Like this is also really interesting. And now we can get let's let's take a moment to get into time travel philosophy, which you know Outlander is a bit haphazard about, but we have gotten into it, right? Like all of. Dragonfly and Amber and the second season are about this question, can we change history, right? So, you know, we, I think, I feel like the show came pretty firmly down on the side of, no, you can't actually change history, right? Like there's different types of, 
I always forget what the different categories of time travel are, but like, you know, there are versions where it's like multiverse and there's parts, there's versions of time travel where you do, you can change history. And then there's types of ways of looking at time travel where you can't change history, that you're basically, your time travel was always kind of embedded in whatever happened. What's interesting, I was just thinking today about this, what's interesting about Galus in all of that is that she believes in time travel for the sake of changing history. Like she even says right before Claire kills her, like we were meant for this. Like this is, this is our role is to change history. What if she calls them the chosen ones, right? And yet she's using prophecy. So like the whole concept of, of a prophecy is that the future is set and it can be told before it happens. But Galus is a person who's like, I'm going to take that prophecy and I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure it happens the way it's just been told to me. And I was like, that's really interesting. Like, that's kind of two conflicting ways of looking about how history unfolds. It's true. Yeah, it is. I, yeah, Galus and Claire, the, the way they orbit each other is definitely the, the show at its most uh, coherent about time travel and... And its own philosophy, really. Right. I mean, yeah. And kind of the most dynamic. It's like, even though you and I just said, like, that the end of the show is like a bit haphazard and not full of meaning. But I was just like, had really we just had three episodes of like, basically, Galus and Claire circling each other. I would have been really satisfied with that. Because I feel like that is getting us into the deep philosophical questions about what does this all mean? Like, if you just have time travel, because like, you need you know, because you want it. That's one thing. And that's definitely, I feel like, how Outlander started. It was like Diana Gabaldon, like she wanted to tell us an 18th century story, but like her female character was talking like a modern woman. So she was like, okay, time travel, that'll fix that. <laughs> and, but she, it was almost like she stumbled on these greater meanings of what time travel can, the questions that time travel can bring up philosophically. And now I just wish we had done so much more of that. Like we had these little interactions between Galus and Claire and, you know, and that gets into like, why magic? Who are we? Why are we here? Why can they time travel? Why can they time travel? We don't know. And the, the books have not so far answered that, right? No, we get in the, in, you know, in the books up until Moby, which is the latest one that has existed at the time that we're recording this. Uh, we get more details about the mechanics and some connections between time traveling characters. But no, but not a greater meaning. I'm like, which again, she could end up just saying there isn't like, it's just like humans, like we're kind of, you know, how did humans become? We just did or not. I mean, it depends how you look at it. If you believe, you know, if you have it, it that all depends on your belief system, I think. And that's, I guess, what I'm getting to about the time travel. It's just like, you know, humans can speak and say words and you can decide different reasons how that came about. And it's the same with time travel. Like some humans can time travel and you can assign meaning to that or not. And that's really the that's really a philosophical question then at that point. It and is. I find that fascinating. Like that's a neat that's a neat thing to delve into. It is. I'll, I'll, I'll never stop being a little bit bummed that Gilles was such a neat character, and I kind of feel like not that they wasted her because she was excellent in the final stretch of season three, but yeah. they could have done more with her. I mean, just like Dougal, they could have done so much. She had a lot more ju plot juice in her. They could have done a lot more with her before they axed her. Yeah, yeah, they could have. I mean, that's this is a moment where they could. I mean, again. Murta stayed alive longer than he was supposed to, so... They could, yeah, they could have just had Claire knock her over the head and then made it ambiguous, and maybe she'll turn up again and be a threat. Yes, but they could have. They they're gonna have. They're going to have a different threatening character next season. <laughs> but then, see, that's another new character that we have to then try to care about. Well, or just, like, be horrified by it. But yes, you're right. I agree with you. He's a, yeah, he's a like, much... The, the villain of the fourth book is a much less interesting person. Yeah, that's, that's what Outlander just really squanders its side characters. Yeah, I mean, like it's getting a little little bit better at like Fergus and Marsali, but otherwise, you know, it gives us one episode characters like the men on the ships who we just really weren't engaged in, and then right. it has characters like Galus and like Dougal, and just kind of squanders them. Again, if you kept reading, some of the people you're <laughs> less interested in now become 
you know, <laughs> for me, my favorite characters. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, the later books are really, I mean, Claire and Jamie are great and I love them, but there's other characters that become much more important to me in the later books. <laughs> Just saying, not saying you have to read them. <laughs> it's just I'm so, I've, I've kind of had it with a, a, too many no, no. random coincidences totally, and many, totally get it. Like, too many people in the rape club I understand completely I understand completely <laughs> alright well now we need to move on to what I keep calling the fire dancing I don't know what else to call it so okay again before Claire got to Galus we had the, the coach stop because of people walking down the road. Yeah, this might, I mean, I, uh, this, okay, right. I guess I said some of this. I apologize, listeners, if I'm repeating myself because I don't remember what I said, but I'm just really troubled, especially in Jamaica. Like, Jamaica is a place that has an incredible history of formerly enslaved people creating a community that actually had to do with the ultimate freedom of Jamaica from British rule. <laughs> um, so it's like almost worse that it's in Jamaica. But uh, again, these people have now been reduced to like people wandering ghost-like on a road and then having a ritual around a fire that again, just felt like it was there to augment our experience of what's going on emotionally for Jamie and Claire. That's what it felt like to me. You know, I can't speak to whether that, you know, had any historical authenticity that that ritual because we don't know because no one there has been developed for us as people. We never got any of their stories. You can't you can't use a historical thing like slavery or use subjugated and enslaved people without telling their story. It's really just irresponsible. It's almost beside the point whether or not it's authentic. Right. That's what I'm saying. They're using this culture as window dressing. Um, well, right. And as spice. I mean, it's just, uh, there's just so many ways that this is offensive. We already talked about this, but I feel like we have to do more because in this scene, it's even worse. Um, they are not only not developed as characters, but like in my eyes, really the way they were used to to augment and tell part of the story that's happening to Jamie and Claire was like downright dehumanizing. And I'm just I'm I'm very upset about it. Yeah, we were meant to gawk at them. They were gawking at them. Right. Right. Exactly. So like we're gawking there, you know, yeah. So again, Outlander, kind of mad at you. That was really disrespectful. This kind of circles back to, uh, sorry, I keep harping on, I, I'm, I'm not, I have said this way too often why I stopped reading the books. I, mm -hmm. I apologize That's for okay. saying that phrase so often. But so my, my main kind of thing about Outlander is that it is kind of a Scottish show. And I really think the show is a lot less strong when it is not in Scotland. I mean, France I, it was bad in its own way. It was less culturally offensive, but just plot-wise. But I really think uh, when Outlander uses... Jamie and Claire are the focal point, and that's fine, and everything else is kind of a backdrop, and that's also fine. But in Scotland, it matters less when cultural things are a backdrop because it's ingrained in who Jamie is. So it doesn't. Feel, it never feels like the culture is a prop. But that's what I'm saying. They never are backdrop in Scotland because the whole story in Scotland is about preserving and respecting that culture. Well, exactly. So that's why I really think this story doesn't really even. Well, not that it doesn't make sense, but just really should not be in anywhere besides Scotland. Yeah. See, I disagree with you on that. <laughs> Again, I think they did it poorly in the show. And I think that the move to the colonies is actually kind of brilliant, personally. I think that it's a fascinating thing to have one of your couple be an outlander, be a person who's traveled in time and is transposed from her, the space that, you know, what the time frame or geographic space that we, that was native to her. But then to have everyone become that, 
but to have Jamie also transposed, it just turns it into a different story. I mean, again, it might be a story that's less interesting to you. It's a different story. And I think that was a fascinating move that, that to go from a story about a person who is an outsider having a relationship with someone who's an insider and then to have that shifted to a place where both of them are outsiders, kind of like he then becomes the outsider um, geographically. She, of course, always the outsider in time. And yet there's certain things about kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the psyche of America that, you know, of course she lived in a different time of America, but there's certain aspects of kind of the mentality of America that she taps into in their new life and is completely foreign to him. So it, it actually, in my eyes, it's a beautiful thing. And the part that was uh, a sad omission, it's not exactly an omission, but like a sad thing we missed out on and the way they depicted it in the show is that in the book, uh, Jamie doesn't use his full, his real name throughout all of Voyager. He's always Alexander Malcolm or using one of his other aliases until that last moment. And it's not on a beach. It's in a house after they've been found on the beach. But he says that exact line that he says to the people when he's when he when they're found in Georgia, where he says, my name is James Fraser and this is my wife, Claire. And in the book, that is the most powerful moment because he had not said that yet. And only when he realized that he's in the colonies did he realize that he was now free to use his real name. And so the amazing thing in the book for me kind of emotionally was that they went through this they went through this long trek, a sea voyage where they where they're go you know, which is kind of a liminal state, that they go from places that they're both familiar with, but they were never at home, right? In the beginning, and they had that in the show, right? She's she's in the future, like back in the place nominally that is her correct place. And he's in Lalibrach, which is the place that's nominally his correct place. And they're not at home. And then they find each other and they go through this voyage. And only at the end of it, can they actually be themselves. And so they both found this place where they can be James Fraser and his wife, Claire. And so like, this is an incredible moment in the book, which we are robbed of because he's calling himself Jamie Frazier on the, on the Artemis already. I would, I would argue though, that um, it did come across maybe not with the same gravity that it has in the mm -hmm. book, but it definitely feels like a moment. Um, Cause even though he ha has been uh, using his name, he hasn't, he's, he's been very cautious throughout the season. Um, introducing himself to new people mm -hmm. um and so it does feel like he's being very uh, surprisingly unguarded um and just presenting himself okay. to strangers so yeah I, I think you do feel some of it okay i'm glad i mean it was just you know in the book it's like very exaggerated like even when he goes to the governor's house he's pretending to be french like then he's using a french name a french variant on his name like there's just a lot in the book it's like a really big deal that he's just really working very hard to not use his real name throughout yeah. And so the two moments where he says Fraser basically is when he names Fergus. So that's a big deal. And then at the end. But OK, I'm glad that that came through because for me, it didn't because I felt the loss of it. So I'm glad that had some of that resonance because for me, it didn't really because I knew what we didn't have. OK, so that was jumping way ahead. Let's go back now. Let's go to Abandoe. Let's talk about this cave and the craziness i don't know what do you want to do you, what are your thoughts <laughs> so i really liked what you were saying earlier about kind of the philosophy of time travel mm -hmm. but this was one sequence when i feel like it is to the show's detriment that it isn't really explained enough how it works because it was just kind of confusing how uh it was a pool of water right um, instead of stones and claire just kind of intuitively knew that i mean i guess because she heard it but I feel like that needed a little bit more explanation than I got. Oh, that's it. Wait, t remind me, did, did Claire um, and um, uh, Roger have the conversation about, about the Loch Ness Monster? I don't remember if that show that happened in the in the show. That happened in the book. Like They actually talked about whether the Loch Ness Monster might actually be... Um, because people always see it looking differently, they had a conversation like speculating that maybe in the lock there was actually a time travel portal. 
and that it was actually dinosaurs coming through. And that's why it always looked like something different and no one could pinpoint it. Like that was just a speculation. But I feel like there was that that was less surprising in the book because there was already this conversation about how time travel spaces could actually be different than a ring of standing stones. I do remember that. I do remember thinking that conversation was cool. And doesn't Claire meet the Loch Ness Monster in book one? And then the yes, show was like, yes. yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> We're totally, not, no. totally happens. And, well, and that's part of the witch trial, actually, is that is that <laughs> is that somebody witnessed that and said said that like she was communing with it. And and that was one of the signs that she's a witch. Yeah, I love I love how the, it's so it's interesting to me how the show kind of hand waves some of the more fantastical elements and then embraces others. Right. Because it almost seems a little bit arbitrary what they decide to hand wave and what they decide to <laughs> amp up. Exactly. Well, that's what I was saying. It's like if if they went more full on, it's it's you kind of have to decide what show you're doing. Yeah, and, and often it doesn't feel like the writers have decided. <laughs> no, no. I mean, this goes back to my sense of like thing happens, thing happens, and again, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about the season as a whole soon. Let's let's talk more about Abandoe right now. Um, right, and the thing about the stones, like her laying out the stones, this is something she had explained to Claire. I don't think we got that explanation on the show. Like she explained, yeah, it like the a little type arbitrary woo woo right. ritual. You're like, what right. the hell is happening? Right. All right. She explained the whole. Th- she explained at some point. She has explained that whole ritual to Claire, and about yeah. like how the stones need to be perfect stones and like a whole thing. So they're so we know that they're very valuable. Like you see Ian grab them at the end, but like you don't. I mean, okay, they're stones. They're probably worth a lot of money, but still, like there's a whole thing about how that they're like super perfect stones that are worth so much money. I mean, yeah, I would say the uh, the show viewer who's not a book reader wouldn't be confused. Like, it, you you definitely got the contents of what was happening in that scene, yeah. but it did feel a little bit arbitrary and a little bit anticlimactic to the whole saga of Claire and Galas, especially considering all their history throughout season one and Galas's brief appearance in season two. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying, and it's. I did like the conversation between Claire and Galus because I like conversations between Claire and Galus, um, and I, you know, again, I had already said I like that the Galus still seemed respectful of Claire's needs, even though she was about to go kill her daughter. Uh, but you know, as much as she could within the boundaries of what she needs to have happen, she was trying to be respectful of Claire's needs. And saying to Ian, don't worry, your death will go for a good cause. Right, but that makes, from Galus's perspective, I think that makes so much sense. Like, that doesn't seem at all random that she's saying that to him, because that's what she believes. Like, I think that Galus honestly can't imagine anyone who's Scottish not having her level of fervent belief in this cause. I'm really starting to think that that's just the reality in which she lives. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And Galus is delightful right up until the end. Right, exactly. Yeah, I really love it. Okay, so yeah, so then, you know, we have at the end, very cute pre-sex. And then again, in my eyes, kind of a little I, th- th- oh, I guess they do they even have sex we don't even it's all pre-sex and still it got a little boring for me it was very cute in the beginning <laughs> I, I agree with that one a little bit and then went a little bit too long for me well that's what I mean I really think they're it it really feels like they're padding out time like I really think episodes should or seasons should be 10 episodes long and not right. 13 <laughs> fair enough fair enough um and then we have the storm which I kind of loved uh I don't know. Yes, it was the drowning very... sequence, the borderline Titanic, two people on the raft sequence. Yes, I totally thought of <laughs> Titanic too. Yeah, I did like the drowning. The voiceover was a bit weird. Um, I don't quite, I mean, it definitely felt like they were, again, very deliberately doing kind of a death and rebirth thing, which makes sense for them arriving in the new world, a world where they can be themselves. So like, you know, it's like they're kind of ticking off boxes of like what would work thematically without it actually having the emotional impact that a strong theme can have like yeah I I, love you know me I love to be intellectual about a theme and like make connections and find patterns but I but there is a difference like you need the theme needs to serve emotional impact not the opposite and the voiceover actually got in the way of the impact for me oh sure right if you had just seen her floating like that yeah and then the kiss, like I do love that it was like kind of like a fairy tale kiss, like is that it he was. like he like he woke her up again with a kiss. 
Oh, you're totally right. If it was just a visual of like her looking like she was dead. I mean, it's like a bit of a Snow White thing, like that she was what? that she was asleep or a Sleeping Beauty thing or that she was asleep. And then he kissed her and she woke up again and started her new life. Well, for several reasons. Yeah, because it's more elegant that way. Um, I've always thought water water sequences are more elegant when there's, you know, that's all that's happening and mm-hmm. there's nothing else. I mean, not to bring this back to life. Right. Still, or you could just have like but... a heartbeat and... <laughs> <laughs> sorry black sales reference <laughs> yeah like the sequence when john silver is drowning and then he sees a goat drowning too and that's really powerful mm-hmm. or even there's a sequence when Anne is swimming through the water and it's just all right i'll stop i'm sorry guys <laughs> but yeah, and, on, and on another level i also found the voiceover distracting because she was talking about how peaceful it is and i'm almost positive that anytime i read about drowning people no. say like it's actually not a peaceful way to go at all no. and you start panicking right and yes. so I was just hearing that voiceover and thinking, this is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I was like fact checking it. Now you're now you're being all Claire. <laughs> like in a world with time travel. Like <laughs> So yeah, that was distracting for me. I need my realism in my time travel story. <laughs> <laughs> But the visual was very lovely. <laughs> it was very lovely. And the visual of the eye of the storm was lovely. But see that it's God, we are just horrible. Because like you you pan out to the eye of the storm and I'm thinking, OK, they're in the eye. But now they're just like on a few pieces of wood and then the eye will pass and then they're in that storm again. But they're just on a few pieces of wood. We're just horrible realists. We need to stop with this. We need to just go with the flow more. <laughs> <laughs> I can go with the flu more when there's blood baths. I'll go with the flu there. Okay, there, that's true. All right, blood baths was that the blood bath was the part of the show that was just clearly made for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> and Lottie Verdvik, I guess she loved it too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I enjoyed their washing ashore. Um, I thought that was a very beautifully shot sequence. It was so beautiful, really beautiful. Right, and that yeah, when they're just panning over them at the end is very beautiful. Uh, one of my friends did bring up the again back to realism, the very realistic thing of like, okay, they do ask if there were other survivors, but they don't actually or no did you bring this up wait i don't remember oh, yeah. i was like am i missing something i don't want to sound oh, like right it. that was you brother you're Someone my friend who brought that up. Yeah. Right. so after this whole season or this whole half season has been about saving young ian then they're on a beach and they don't see him and they know vaguely that somebody else survived but they don't know it's him or fergus or Mersali, and they're like oh great okay awesome let's hug everything is fine yeah nobody seems remotely concerned about it <laughs> Nope. <laughs> but it was beautiful. It was. If not completely realistic to how their emotions probably would be at that moment. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Right. The I'm James Frazier and this is my wife Claire happens after in the book after they know that everyone else is fine, which makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. All right. You ready to move on to talking about the season as a whole? Yeah. Which let's we do it. kind of have done throughout, but let's do it a little bit more. All right. 25 years ago, you dropped out of the sky into my life, and now again you appear on my doorstep. Strange how fate keeps bringing us together. I never met another traveler, only you. We share a bond, something even you and Jamie can't share. Okay. How'd you like the season as a whole? I liked it better than season two, which is not difficult. And I liked it better than the second. I, I still think I would say season one was the best and then fo- followed by this one. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I thought that this season, uh, the first half of the season was very strong and yeah. I was very engaged and I was happy that Outlander was kind of be- recognizing its strengths. And I really liked the way, I mean, we were talking about this in early episodes. They were contrasting Jamie and Claire's storylines and it felt very elegant and then, as we mentioned in the second half, it felt kind of more, and then this happened, and then this happened, um, and it felt kind of haphazard. Um, so I would give it a B minus. <laughs> that's pretty good. I feel like that's a good grade, actually. <laughs> hmm. What do you think? I, you know, I mean, I agree with you on all the, th- the points you said. Um, I really, I was so excited after the first three episodes so excited. I really felt like they were 
that they were going to tell us a cohesive story that had threads that go throughout. And because those first three episodes were so cohesive and felt so meaningful. And the fourth episode was great by itself, like still felt like it was part of that. I just, and I guess even the fifth half, I mean, I guess it was like the first half. It really was. It felt, I mean, the first three episodes in particular really worked for me as beautiful storytelling that had just so much emotional impact and thematic impact at the same time, which is really what I want. I want, I want to be told a deliberate story. I want to be told a story that where the beginning of the story and the end of the story, whether that's the story overall or within a season feels like it has a beginning and an end and that there is some progression and arc that happens that all feels like it's part of the same thing where each where you know ideally each part of it actually really is part of that structure okay that's the best case scenario the first three episodes really felt like they were promising that sort of thing and I was very excited about it um and then I think we moved on to like okay we're not we're losing focus but there's still like enough great stuff that I'm that I'm okay if they stick the landing, like if, if it's like the beginning has this really strong thematic thing and the ending follows through with that, even if the middle is a little like messy and less disciplined and less feeling like part of one big thing, like that's okay. Um, I was really hopeful for these three episodes that that would be the case, that the, that the last three episodes would really take what happened in the beginning three episodes and bring all of that to some place that that showed character development and thematic development and kind of took us to a new place that felt like part of the same thing, but with a new twist on it. And I didn't really get that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I guess I'm am similar to you. I, I don't I don't. I think probably the first half of season one is still going to is still my favorite part of Outlander. And I don't know how much of that I haven't gone back and watched it in a while. I did watch it a few times back when it happened before I discovered Black Sails and it took over my life. Um, I think the first half of season one is that more than this season is. This season at its height is better than anything but I think the Garrison Commander and the Wedding episode, which are still my two favorite episodes. Um, but the end is too haphazard. I feel like they forgot. I mean, maybe I'm assuming they had the purpose that they did in the beginning, but it felt very deliberate in the beginning. And it felt like at the end, they forgot what they had started with. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And then in the middle, there's tons of delightful things, tons of them, tons of moments that I really love. Tons, you know, when we have again, we have Lord John Gray, which is like worth a lot for me because they they did him beautifully. Like I will forever be thankful for them taking my favorite character and adapting his scenes so that they took out everything that kind of made me cringe about those scenes and adding stuff that made him even better and more fun. So I will forever be thankful for that. Like that is a huge vote in the favor of season three. But I mo right at this moment, my largest sense is is lost opportunity. Yeah, although I will give them the major uh, points of keeping Rita alive. Oh my goodness! I know. Right. Okay. That I'm alone. Wishing, that alone yeah. is a reason to watch season four. Yeah, I mean, I also yeah. As someone who could not get through book four, this season was my litmus test to see: am I going to stop watching the show right now, mm -hmm. or am I going to keep watching it? And this season gave me a mixed argument. And ultimately, I think I've decided when season four comes back, I'll start watching it. I'll watch the first few episodes mm -hmm. and I'll see how they are. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely going to watch the whole thing. There is no question. I'm going to watch Outlander as long as they give me Outlander. And I'm going to eternally be in hope that it fills the promise that I think it has. Um, which, you know, it has moments of shining. It has moments of showing that promise. And and then it has moments where it really doesn't. Um, but I, I'm sticking with it. I'm definitely going to keep watching. I definitely, um, at the very least, I get moments that delight me. Yes. 
So that's an, that's enough for me. And then I can always hope that it actually becomes uh, becomes the show that I think it could be. I mean, I think it just it's it's so close to the show a show that could be just truly beautifully made on every level. Like it's beautiful. It's always beautiful. And Katrina Balfe and Sam Hewen and a bunch of the other actors are fantastic. And what I just keep hoping for is that the writing will start to be consistently what it is when it's at its best. I would agree with that. All right. I think that's a good place to end. No. (laughs) All right. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for doing this podcast with me. It's been super fun. Even when we're not madly in love with stuff, it's still been so much fun to talk to you about it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it has been really fun. Thank you for listening to me be a bit of a grump about the show. And I apologize to anyone who (laughs) was annoyed by my level of grumpiness. But thank you for Anyway. Thanks to Barry, you are now officially Tough Cookie, and I really <laughs> like that name for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me just make a few podcast announcements. This is the last podcast episode of Can I Just Say uh, for 2017. We will start again in January, and I'm not sure what yet what the topic will be. Elizabeth and I need to sit down and decide where we go first. We have a long and growing list. Um, We really enjoyed doing books and adaptations. I think, you know, that will be sprinkled through 2018. We'll choose books and adaptations to do as separate podcast episodes that are tied to each other. Uh, Lauren, I hope you'll come talk to us again about stuff. I have stuff in mind. (laughs) You know, I'm always ready to come talk. Uh, So, yes, so we will, uh, you can definitely look on Twitter to see what we will be doing Uh, We'll make some announcements after the new year. And so happy holidays to everyone. Happy new year. Uh, For Fathoms Deep listeners, I owe you all a an episode that we recorded a while ago with Luke Roberts. So we I will be editing that sometime. It'll come out sometime between now and the new year. (laughs) He's fabulous. And I really look forward to releasing that episode as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone who's been listening. Uh, You know, a great thing to do for the holidays is become a patron of Common Room Radio. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Common Room Radio. We would really appreciate it. And uh, Lauren, tell everyone where they can find you on the internet. My Twitter handle is just my name at Lauren Sarner, S-A-R-N-E-R. And yeah, just as a reminder, I interviewed, uh, I I think her name is pronounced Lota. Oh, really? Um, I've always been saying Lota. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the first, yeah, on the phone, they said Lota. So mm-hmm. L- Lota Verbeek. <laughs> and I will put that link in the show notes. Uh, yeah, she was delightful. Uh, and also, also, wait, what is it? Money Cab, right? What is it called? Oh, Cash Cab. Cash Cab. Uh, you have to go find Lauren's video of herself in the Cash Cab because it's adorable. It's, that's a pin to my Twitter page. Um, if you're familiar with that game show, I did it for a story and it's, it's pretty fun. So yes, if you've been wondering what Lauren looks like, <laughs> you'll get to see. <laughs> you're going to see me be mediocre at answering trivia questions. It was great. I loved it very much. Um, so yes, thank you again, everyone for listening and happy new year. And uh, we'll see you back in 2018 with lots of fun new podcasts. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye. Can I Just Say Podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag Can I Just Say and follow us on Twitter at Just Say Podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening.